Well, as we begin today's study, uh, today we want to revisit a subject we did some time back from our booklet, We Believe, uh, The Study of Last Things. Uh, it's also, uh, the theological term is eschatology, uh, it, which means the study of last things. And in that, uh, one of the topics is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's called Second Coming. So to lead us in that study, uh, we will have Praveen to take us through it. And uh, as usual, we will have our discussions. So let me just uh, uh, commit our time into the Lord's hands for his uh, blessings, and then we'll start. All right. Join me as I pray. Loving, gracious Father, thank you so much that you have made this space uh, this evening to be able for us to connect and thank you so much for the technology that makes it possible. We pray for the uninterrupted uh, platform on which we can study and learn and continue to grow. Uh, do help us to open our minds to perceive uh, what is being presented to us. We ask for your continued uh, presence with us this evening and we do this in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Over to Praveen. Good evening everyone. As Pastor said, the topic we are going to discuss today is the second coming and the moment we hear about it, all our minds might have been opened up and uh, Many of you must be, uh, you know, even maybe go, your minds would be going back to the old WCG days where uh, we have so many uh, reasons and so many details of it. But uh, definitely what I'm going to present would not be having all those details. Uh, but one thing I can uh, really and truly say and appreciate that is our church was... Uh, very much interested in learning about the second coming of Jesus. In fact, if you see in one of our emblem, uh, it has the millennial kingdom picture where uh, the lion and the lamb will be uh, eating to staying together. And uh, that is the vision. That is the hope that all of us are looking forward, though, whatever we were believing in those days and the reformation took place and uh, uh, we uh, certain things have changed, but definitely the hope of second coming is not changed, especially that has been revealed in that uh, uh, emblem uh, where sheep and lion can come together and live in harmony, uh, which is, of course, uh, symbolic. And all of us look, are looking forward for that. So I would be focusing completely on this very small a portion of this vast subject, second coming, the very act or very event of second coming of Jesus. So, so many things are related to that. I'm, I'm not going to uh, discuss about them, but I'll be discussing only about this event of uh, second coming. What is second coming? And we can find the answer in our booklet, we believe, and it is uh, as follows. The Holy Scriptures Teach that Jesus, uh, teach that Jesus Christ, who came to earth first, which is in first coming through his virgin birth, will come again in what is often called his second coming. The glorified human person, Jesus, will return bodily to earth in power and glory to judge the dead and reign over all nations in the fullness of the kingdom of God. This return, will be this return will inaugurate the resurrection of the dead and the final judgment, which will bring to an end all evil and ushers in the reward of a new heaven and a new earth to be enjoyed by all who place their trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior and humbly receive his welcome into his eternal rule and reign. So this is the basic uh, understanding of the second coming of Jesus. I don't know why they have such a long sentences. Of course, all those matters, all those topics mentioned in, in that particular sentence are uh, uh, interconnected. So the second coming of Jesus is nothing but the bodily return of the glorified Jesus or the bodily return of the resurrected and ascended Jesus 
back to earth. And this second coming is sometimes been kind of confused. And in fact, some people say there are, uh, I mean, it has divided Christians and groups into two groups. And one group of people believe the second coming is a two phase event. And some believe the second coming is a single uh, one event. And the people who are believing the second coming as two phase event, they call it as uh, phase one as the rapture and phase two as the second coming. And people who are believing the second coming event is only one and there are no two phases and both uh, both are one. And uh, they call this, uh, uh, this perspective alone make justice to call it as second coming. Otherwise, it, it, there should be three comings of Jesus. Okay, so whatever they, these two perspectives are there, and uh, and for these two perspectives, definitely there are biblical, uh, you know, support. There are verses that support these perspectives. And as I uh, as I speak, I would like to bring many a few more uh, thoughts to look at these subjects. And I would like to let you know beforehand that uh, everything I'm speaking is not dogmatic. Okay, and there are essential subjects and there are non-essential subjects. In essential subjects, we can we all should be having unity, and non-essential subjects where we can have liberty. As I said, uh, you know, everything I'm speaking is not dogmatic, and everything I'm speaking is not GCA position. Of course, I'm going to bring the GCA position at the end. Uh, there, there are various thoughts that we can think about and consider uh, as we study about uh, the second coming of jesus christ so and god also gives us a little freedom to uh speculate on certain subjects so we take uh that uh, that freedom so uh the people who believe the second coming uh as a two-phase event they call it rapture and second coming and they have their reasons for this because there are scriptures which which uh teach a kind, uh, the, the kind of second coming, the kind of events that take place. Uh, 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 sorry, there are two diverse ways of, um, uh, you know, uh, scriptures that explain about the second coming of Jesus. It's one, uh, one, sec one group of scriptures, they teach uh, the second coming is more like a, a rapture, which is caught up and taken up. And the other one is more or like a coming down and uh, uh, taking control over the earth so there are differences between this rapture and second coming and those differences are as follows the rapture in rapture christ will be uh, coming to the air only he won't be coming on coming down onto the earth and in the second coming christ will be coming onto the earth where we all know that it would be called the mount of olives where he would be standing and in the rapture saints are going to be raised up and meeting jesus in uh, in the air as apostle paul writes in first thessalonians chapter 5 when the trumpet uh, sound come and dead in christ will raise and those who are living will be transformed and meet jesus in the sky and uh, in the second coming saints will be returning with jesus christ and in the rapture christ comes to take the church he comes uh suddenly and he takes the church up into heaven and in the second coming he comes along with the church to judge the world and in the rapture there will be a lot of rejoicing people call it especially for people who are believing and for the people who are uh, who could not put their faith in jesus christ there will be trouble tribulation and troubles and in the second coming it is completely about destruction both kind of uh, explanations for the coming of jesus were found in the scripture that is the reason this group of people say these two are two different phases of coming of jesus and the other group as i said they have only single uh, reason that is if uh, the second coming is of two phases then it should be called the third coming and the second coming of Jesus is the center of all these eschatological perspectives. Whatever the perspective we take, the second coming is the center of it. Okay. And there are many perspectives and some of them I would like to just uh, share with you briefly. And then I would like to continue. So the second coming of Jesus Christ is a bodily return of Christ to the earth in glory. Uh, first as judge and as the king. 
And this, the other word we find is raptured, the instantaneous gathering up of the whole church from the earth to meet Christ, meet Christ in the air and be with him forever. And when does this second coming is going to take place? That is what going to define and decide the perspective that we are upholding. One perspective uh, people, spe people speak about is premillennialism, which means Jesus will be coming before the millennial kingdom. Before that, I need to tell you, what is this millennial kingdom? The millennial kingdom is nothing but the logo we found in the GCI, uh, not GCI, WCG. The thousand year reign of Jesus where there will be absolute and complete peace and joy and uh, harmony in the world and in the creation. So that is called a millennial, uh, millennial kingdom which would reign for thousand years and in even that also we are not sure whether it is only thousand years because uh, Apostle Peter comes and throws a bomb saying like for God one day God one day for God maybe thousand years for us. So we don't know what these times are about but uh, the, the, there is a description of absolute complete peace and harmony uh, given in the Bible and this millennial kingdom is referred uh, to that. So Jesus would come before the millennial kingdom. That is called pre-millennialism. So that is one perspective. And in this perspective, again, there are three, uh, three more divisions. That is pre-millennial, uh, pre-tribulation rapture. As I said, people have this two phase, understanding of two phase, uh, uh, second coming of Jesus. They say uh, among them, yeah. Rapture should come before the tribulation. These all are people who are believing in pre-millennial view. Okay, Jesus would come before the millennial kingdom. So first rapture would take place. Then, then there will be seven years of tribulation. And then Jesus will be coming for the second time onto the mount, on the Mount of Olives. And uh, he defeats uh, Antichrist uh, and his, uh, what we'll call his supporters. And he restores Israel and redeems Israel. And then there will be a thousand years reign where church and Christ, church and Christ will be administering the world. This is pre-millennial view. And there is post-millennial view. They call Jesus will be coming after the millennial kingdom. Which they say this view that the world will be Christianized gradually and the church will reign for a millennium after which the second coming Will occur, which means from the gospel time onwards, from the acts of apostle, we all are struggling. We are share, we all are sharing the gospel, and one day gradually the entire world will be Christian, and uh, there will be a peace and harmony in this world. And then at uh, the end of thousand years of such experience, Jesus will be coming. So this is called post millennial view, and there is another perspective called a millennial view. This view. Uh, says that there will be no millennium involving earthly uh, rule of either Christ or the church. The second coming of Christ will simply occur at the end of the history. They say there is no millennial kingdom. That is only figurative, whatever written in the scripture. And there is no kingdom as such. So Jesus, once he finishes his work and at the end of human history, he would come and uh, he will establish his kingdom ultimately. That is uh, a millennial view. A means no, no millennium. So a millennial view means no millennial kingdom. So that is the perspective. As I said, in the pre-millennial view, there are again uh, three more perspectives that the one is pre-tribulation <coughs> rapture perspective, and there is a mid-tribulation rapture perspective, and then there is a post-tribulation rapture perspective. And I'm, even I'm in the mid-tribulation rapture perspective, there are two rapture perspectives. One is Jesus would be coming in the middle of the, uh, the seven years tribulation period, three and a half years of uh, uh, peaceful reign of Antichrist, and then three and a half years of very bad tribulation uh, people uh, talk about. Exactly in between uh, both periods, Jesus would come. That is one perspective of millennial kingdom, uh, sorry, um, mid-tribulation rapture view. And there is another rapture view that is called during this tribulation time, people who are being believed the same moment they will be caught up. So this is also another perspective. So there are so many perspectives about uh, 
uh, eschatology, but all these perspectives are surrounded or centered around this particular event called second coming. Premillennial view starts with the rapture of rapture, uh, first coming, I mean, Jesus coming and taking up the church. <coughs> Postmillennial view is defined as <laughs> the coming of Jesus as the end of millennial kingdom. So whatever Christian perspective we are bringing, the second coming is the center and all these things are surrounding this. And I don't want to go into all the details to prove pre-millennial view is right or post-millennial view is right or a millennial view is right, pre-tribulation or post-tribulation, mid-tribulation, because there is so much of discussion take, uh, happened and uh, all these perspectives, they do have their uh, uh, source in the Bible, and it all depends on how they are interpreting. And uh, there are so many speculations, and uh, there is no point in fighting over these matters. But it is very important for us to understand why the second coming is for, why Jesus is coming again. That we need to understand. And the purpose of the second coming is very much for uh, very much important for us to understand why Jesus second coming is so important. Some say the second coming of Jesus is very important and required because in his first coming, he was rejected by people asking. Jesus was assigned to do a, a threefold ministry. That is a ministry as a prophet, priest, and as king, as a prophet, uh, he spoke the word of God, he embodied and spoke God's truth as it is written in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 to 2, God revealed uh, in the last days through his son, Jesus Christ, he spoke to us through Jesus, Jesus has been the mouthpiece of God uh, to communicate his message to us in which he acted as a prophet and then as a priest he offered the perfect sacrifice for sin, as uh, the author of Hebrew writes in chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, 11 to 18, he as a, himself as a priest, according to uh, the lineage of, uh, uh, according to the line of Melchizedek. So Jesus could accomplish this prophet, uh, prophet uh, aspect of his ministry and priest aspect of his ministry. But as a king, he could not accomplish much because people have rejected him as king. That's why he is coming back again physically where he is going to establish uh, his kingdom. So, but uh, since Christ was rejected in his role as a king, uh, we can find in uh, John chapter 19, verse 12 to 17, uh, where Pilate asks, do you want me to release your, the king of the Jews? People say, no, we don't have any king. So they, they rejected Jesus as their king. Uh, so uh, he, uh, people rejected his role as a king. And because of that, he will return first as a judge to subject God's enemies to himself and then execute judgment for sin and then to rule and reign forever as king, as king of kings and lord of lords. We can find uh, scriptures uh, su that support this, uh, I mean, this uh, particular thing from Daniel chapter 2, verse 34 and 44 to 45 and 1 Corinthians also, 15, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse uh, uh, 24 to 28. Definitely Jesus is going to establish uh, the kingdom of God and there is no doubt about it. And... Uh, <coughs> But there are few things we can consider. You know, Jesus is coming to judge. That's what this uh, some people say. And in John chapter 12, verse 31, before his crucifixion, uh, Jesus says, now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world be casted out. Uh, so the world was already judged. The ruler of this world was already judged. And what else Jesus is going to judge? And uh, that does not mean he is not going to judge kindly. Don't misunderstand me. Uh, so we speak so much. We want to see the judgment of God coming onto this earth, uh, coming onto this world, and we look at it as more violent uh, manner. And it is not necessary for us to look in the same way because the word judgment is not always uh, punishing the evil. The word judgment is also restoring 
the affected, restoring the oppressed. We do not know how this judgment is going to be at the uh, end, in the second coming, how this judgment is going to be. We don't, we don't know exactly uh, to say that it, it has to be like this. And don't, I'm not saying that it, it is going to be just a reconciliation only. And there is a possibility for this to be violent as the event took place, uh, I mean, the flood, Noah's time flood. There we can see a violent kind of judgment expression. And during uh, the Sodom and Gomorrah, that is the time also we could see a violent expression of judgment. We don't know it can be a violent expression of judgment and uh, we have to take it as a restoration of the oppressed. And so there is no necessity for us to draw conclusions on this to say uh, when Jesus is coming to judge, so it is going to be more like uh, this only. And he is going to judge the sin. Um, but definitely one thing we, uh, we understand that either uh, through his love, reconciliation, way, or either to say even in better words, uh, uh, either by the left hand power of God or right hand power of God. You might have heard these words. Right hand power of God is more of uh, this miraculous and powerful, uh, you know, the Noah kind of or the Sodom and Gomorrah kind of uh, power. And that is one either through that or by changing the pe all people's heart. His love is a refining fire. His presence is a refining fire. Either through this, we do not know. He is going to consume and he's going to judge and he's going to uh, establish uh, his kingdom. And uh, Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 says that the seventh angel sounded and there were, there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world became the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. He is going to establish his kingdom. That is for sure. And as these people said, Jesus is coming again because he was rejected as king. But it is not something new we find. Actually, uh, after God creating entire, I mean, entire creation, he can, he can stand and say, I'm the king of this creation and you are my subjectives. And he can say that to Adam, but he didn't do that. He gave, he gave this authority to Adam and uh, Israel rejecting or people rejecting God's king, uh, God as king is not new. We can find in First Samuel chapter eight verse seven, uh, where um, the children of Israel come to Samuel and ask for God, ask for king. Then when while Samuel was praying to God, and uh, God says, uh, "Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have rejected you. So they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign." over them. They rejected Jesus as a king. But in the gospel, uh, at the same time in the gospels, we find uh, as we, uh, I mean, we, we, as I read previously in book of, from book of John, that when Pilate asked uh, the children of Israel, should I punish uh, uh, the king of Jews or Barabbas? They said, we don't have any king. So there also they have rejected. But at the same time, gospel speak the, from the beginning of Jesus' life till the end of Jesus' life and even after that he was, uh, he claimed himself as a king and he was preached himself as a king and he acted like a king. Matthew chapter 2 verse 2, isn't it so interesting while the Magi have come and as they were inquiring for Jesus, they said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Can anybody born king? People become kings. Nobody born, nobody had born kings. Jesus is the one who was born king. And then if you see uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 3, Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, uh, it is as you say. Where he said, I am, as you are saying, I am the king. And uh, apostles have seen Jesus, you know, especially uh, Stephen, if you remember, of course, Stephen is a uh, deacon. Stephen, during his crucifixion, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And Apostle Peter says, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. What does it, it indicate? It indicates that Jesus is the Lord and he is the king. It is not that he failed to accomplish the kingly ministry of uh, his kingly ministry. That's why he has to come so that he can, he can become a king. 
Jesus is such a he is sovereign. No, if the people acceptance is going to make him as a king, who is uh, who are really powerful? If Jesus becomes a king by their acceptance, people become the king makers. Who is powerful? But Jesus is always king. He was born as a king. He lived as a king, and he died as a king. What is the board says on uh, on his cross? Jesus of Nazareth, King of Jews. He died as a king, and uh, uh, he was buried. And through his resurrection, he broke the seal of Caesar. which is an open open rebellion against the caesar and uh, in if you read book of acts the book of acts ends saying paul preaching in rome that jesus as the lord book of acts and luke both are written by luke how does book of luke start luke start in the days of caesar augustus who is caesar augustus caesar augustus was the lord it starts with caesar augustus as the lord and a book of acts is the continuation of luke and it ends preaching paul preaching jesus as the lord caesar was the lord in the beginning and it has changed and jesus became the lord and romans chapter 1 verse 14 where jesus where apostle uh, paul says that through his resurrection jesus proved himself as the son of god what is this son of god so when we hear son of god we this word also it takes us only to trinity to in our minds but for a roman citizen in the first century the word son of god it doesn't take us to trinity take them to trinity actually because there was already a cult called son of god religion which was established by caesars caesars they die and they will be uh, become gods and they are called sons of god Jesus died he rose again from the dead and Paul is calling in roman context him as a son of god which means the romans understood him he is the lord caesar was the sovereign lord and there is no greater lord than caesar those days but here when jesus uh, was called as a son of god he became the sovereign lord so saying that jesus could not accomplish his kingly ministry in the first coming is sounds uh, and biblical to me uh, so he has to come the second time and to establish his kingdom but what i what i feel is uh, the scripture says that jesus was the lord and is the lord and he is always the lord he is sovereign and in the second coming he is going to establish <coughs> uh his kingship or, or not kingship his kingdom uh in a physical and tangible manner to all people whether believers or unbelievers presently jesus is our king we are believing in him he is reigning in our hearts and in the second coming he is going to establish his physical kingdom where believer or non believer all the living creatures are going to experience his kingdom in a physical manner also that's how we can look at the second coming where jesus is going to establish his kingdom and some say uh christ uh, christ must judge the sins of his people before he bring uh, bring the blessing of the kingdom that is why he is coming in the second coming and he is going to judge all the sin and uh, destroy all the sin so that his kingdom can be uh, established which is totally free from sin is it is jesus god jesus going to judge sin in the second coming and if it is so what did he do on the cross jesus dealt with the sin on the cross and he accompli- completed it and uh, he dealt with the sins of the past present and even the future all those sins are dealt uh, and that's why john calls jesus in john chapter 1 verse 20 and look at the lamb of god who take away who take away the sin of the world so he is not purging it in the second coming but he purged it already in the first coming and hebrew chapter uh, 9 verse 28 it says so christ having been offered once to bear the sins of the many will appear second time not to deal with sin but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him so the second coming of jesus is not just about is not about judging the sin 
but it is to uh, it is to meet the people who are eagerly waiting for him and to redeem the people who are eagerly waiting for him jesus has already dealt with sin once for all so when we say he is going to deal with that later where are we are underestimating the complete work of jesus christ in his first coming so we cannot do that and then uh, uh some say the eschatological word the day of the lord prophesied in the old testament will begin with with the with god's judgment and end with the millennial kingdom the day of the lord has already started when jesus rose again from the dead that's why even today we call well, what is this year this is 2021 ad what is ad ad is anno domini which means the day of the lord or where God, the lord has his dominion so jesus has already have dominion <coughs> from him through his resurrection itself and uh thinking that he is going to come and destroy all the kingdoms and go then only he is going to become exp ex exercise his dominion uh, i i don't think it would make much sense uh, because it's also written in colossians chapter 1 verse 19 to 20 where it is written god wants to accomplish it uh, uh, through jesus sacrifice it is written colossians chapter 1 verse 19 to 20 god was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross he is going to bring all of them together and he is going to bring put all of them under his feet through the through what jesus has accomplished okay it is not the some kind some kind of uh, war of course as i said uh, you know we can keep it open and we can uh, think about that war also that is no problem we have uh, we can exercise our freedom in this but jesus is coming to bring the fullness of the kingdom uh, kingdom of god's experience to us the second coming of jesus for us is to bring us into the fullness full experience it is not uh, uh, it is not that uh, the kingdom was not there jesus is not king yet jesus did not have his uh, dominion yet he did not deal with sin yet and he has to come again and uh, do those work as if his first time his work was accomplished though jesus said it is finished it is not that way he has finished everything and in the second coming he is bringing his kingdom in in fullest experience to us that's how we need to look at it um and that's what uh, written in philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to 11 uh here it is uh, especially in verse 9 we find therefore god also has highly exalted uh, uh exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth it is in plural he has already given the name that is higher than any other name he has the dominion already and we are going to experience it in, in its fullness then why is jesus coming number one is it is a fulfillment of the prophecy god prophesied that he is go he is he is coming and he is establishing his kingdom especially when we talk about the fulfillment of uh, the prophecy also we tend to be very fast to take these words uh, and we try to put in uh, put in the frame that we already have in mind which is mostly anthropomorphism more converting more of god's truth into our human thing we push god into our uh, theology which should not be doing especially when it comes to uh, prophecy some of those prophecies are fulfilled in the jesus first coming and some of them have not fulfilled yet and definitely they are going to be fulfilled in his second coming but we don't know the timeline yet we don't have the details of all those timeline it is like uh, like you know if you if you are in a, any uh, mountains a place where mountains are there uh, you can you can if you have seen a mountain range you can understand when you look at a mountain range there will be so many mountains one behind the other for our naked eyes we feel we, we see something and we feel one mountain is there and there is another mountain we may put give numbers first come one comes first and behind there is another 
but when we go into those mountains only we really understand the reality it is not true all those mountains uh, sorry the the picture we see there it is not the order of the mountains our eyes deceive us or sometimes if you are going close to mountains you know especially uh, if you are traveling towards the mountain you are actually driving towards closer to the mountain but as much closer as you are going it appears as if the mountain is going backward it is going backward and it's becoming far and far for us, from us so that is the that is the problem with the prophecy and pictures especially the timeline so uh, it is i i personally feel it is not we cannot put uh, we cannot draw a timeline and say the, all these scriptures are according to this time and like, timeline only it has to happen uh, i don't think that would be uh, a right way for us to do that and uh, especially uh, when we are de de describing uh, so when we are uh, interpreting the prophecies many of them are symbolic and many of them are literal and we are not given all complete understanding yet to decide which is symbolic which is uh, uh, literal we 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 still don't have the complete understanding yet uh, these all are uh, things about future which we do not know uh, which is full of uh, speculations uh, so G and even the prophecies are uh, prophecies are written like this john who was living in the first century and uh, for example if second coming of jesus in the 20th 21st century being a man living in the first century seeing things of 21st century and how would he explain he explains in his own language, first century language. If he has seen an aeroplane and jet that is coming and fighting, what he would say, oh, I have seen an eagle that is coming from the west and it is conquering and uh, there is fire in its mouth and it is conquering the lands in the east and the kings of the east bow down before the land, uh, before the kings of, uh, uh, sorry, before uh, this eagle and before the kings of the west. How does it look like? It looks like America. <laughs> It is actually America fighting uh, the wars in the Middle East. <laughs> okay. And John writes in such a way it looks entirely differently. And we may not be able to interpret them completely. And we can have, we can play with them. That's no problem with that. But let we don't, we cannot draw conclusions at them. So while we are interpreting these prophecies and special second coming, we should be careful. Uh, we cannot draw conclusions there uh, and we cannot draw especially especially the timelines and why would jesus come back he would come back because he said that he would come back since he said that he uh, he would come back he would definitely come back and he keeps his promises and then why would you another next point why would jesus come back why the second coming will take place it is because we can see a pattern in the Bible from Genesis to the Revelation. In Genesis, God came down to the garden garden to meet Adam. Why? For fellowship. And God came down to Moses to have conversation. Then they, he came down to the tabernacle. And if you look at the picture, it is so beautiful. Tabernacle will be there. Around it, all the tribes will be there. Just like sitting around the bonfire. Okay. God's presence is there. And then his presence came down to the temple. And then his presence came down to earth and into our very flesh. Even to our death. Uh, John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, a tabernacle among the, amongst us. And we have seen the glory of the only begotten of the father. And then second coming, Jesus is coming down. So always he is coming down. Why? Because he wants to tabernacle himself amongst his people. And the same thing mentioned in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. It says, I heard a loud voice from the heaven saying, Behold, behold, the tabernacle of the Lord is with men, and he will dwell with them, and he shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And it, uh, they shall be called his people, he shall be called their God. Why would Jesus want to come back for the second time? Because he is missing you and me. In the first coming, he might have had a date with us. Now he wants to completely stay in our house and to have the breakfast, lunch and dinner completely with us. 24-7, he wants to be with us. He wants to completely pitch. Previously, he might have pitched his tent. Now he wants to build his temple where we, you and me come together and we live together 
that is what the desire of God and that is a pattern we can see from Genesis till the revelation. That's why he would like to come back for the second time. And I'll just close it in five minutes. Uh, there are a few more topics to cover, but I'll just go through it because these are things you know already. That's why I would like to go through it uh, very fast. And <clears throat> uh, especially... Uh, and one, one, one point I would like to make that is at my, Matthew chapter 20, 24, 20, uh, 24, 27 to 44 and Luke chapter 21, Mark chapter 13, we find uh, where Jesus gives the signs of his second coming, where disciples came and asked Jesus, when, where, uh, you know, and what will be the sign of your coming? I was just wondering, these disciples did not even understand first ascension of Jesus. These people did not understand when Jesus said in John chapter 14, I'm going to the father and you know the way. And uh, Philip came and said, we don't know the way. And uh, they don't even know where he is going. There are several times they asked him, where are you going? We don't know. And they asked about his second coming. Uh, do, do you really think the disciples understood those days uh, what the second coming is about? I don't think they have all that understanding the day one itself. After the Holy Spirit came, they got their understanding become better and better. So you can think about this. These are some of the thoughts I'm just sharing with you. You can openly think about. As I said, all everything I'm speaking is not dogmatic. But uh, scripture clearly uh, speaks about uh, uh, the, some of the aspects of his second coming and then the nature of second coming. The aspects of second coming is it is going to be sudden and unexpected. And no one knows when Christ will return. And it will be uh, like Jesus is coming with great power and glory. And as I said, this power and glory, we cannot just simply go back to that uh, uh, mind frame we have to think about only the right hand of right hand power of God. We don't know how it is, but he, it is for sure he is coming with power and glory. And the whole earth will know it. And uh, Christ will come in judgment. And as I said, even the moment we hear the word judgment, we don't need to uh, draw, uh, you know, get into the same picture, uh, punish the evil and give the rewards to the good. The same typical uh, dualistic uh, Western understanding of judgment. But many places in the Bible, the word judgment is restorative. So we can think in that direction also. How it is going to happen, we don't know the details. And uh, it can be, it definitely it can be with the, uh, like the right hand power, the miraculous power and uh, violent power also, we don't know. And Christ would come down onto the Mount of Olives that we can see. He would defeat all his enemies <coughs> and establishes uh, his kingdom. And uh, what are all the enemies that we are talking about? Most of the times we think about uh, the kingdoms of uh, humans only. But actually, if you read uh, 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 Book of Corinthians, Apostle Paul says the last enemy to be defeated is death itself. All the others are defeated already. The Satan was defeated already in the crucifixion, uh, uh, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, how is he going to defeat these enemies? Either it can be love or it can be uh, with power. We don't know. Somebody said, you know, uh, God does not have any enemies because he makes all his enemies his friends. So we don't know, we can just be open about it. Uh, and then I would like to just share about uh, the nature of second coming. The nature of second coming is number one point is it is certain. The physical coming of Jesus is certain. He is going to come for sure. And it is both imminent, uh, sorry, imminent and delayed, okay? Uh, we we have so much of problem. We want to find when is he coming. Uh, let me tell you, it is both imminent and coming. It can it can be next moment, or it can be delayed. We have two examples in the Bible. The first group of people are the church in Jerusalem, uh, which was formed after the Pentecost. They all thought Jesus is going to come tomorrow or day after tomorrow evening or something. So they sold everything that they have. They had everything in common. And then they ran short of their resources. So they ran out of their resources. These are one group of people who waited, uh, who thought Jesus would come imminently, uh, but it didn't happen. 
And if you see, even in Paul's teaching in the beginning of uh, his teach, uh, his conversion, he also was holding the same imminent uh, coming of Jesus position. And later, he realized it can be delayed also with the group, the group we can identify is the church at Thessalonica and uh, church at Corinth. Since Jesus was coming late, the people are dying. So what is going to happen to those people? That is where Jesus, uh, sorry, Apostle Paul comes and shares the glorious news to all of us. When the trumpet shall blow, the, when the trumpet shall sound comes, the dead in Christ will raise and the living in Christ will be transformed and meet him in glorious bodies. So definitely there is a resurrection. That's the message Apostle Paul was preaching. These are the two groups of people we can find in Book of Acts who are believing in imminent coming of Jesus and delayed coming of Jesus. The thing is, the nature of second coming of is both imminent and delayed. It can happen tomorrow or day after tomorrow. It can be delayed also. And uh, Matthew chapter 24 verse 36 says, uh, uh, but concerning the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the sun, but the father only. Jesus himself is saying, I don't know about second coming of uh, my second coming. And what, what, what we also can hold the same position. If Jesus himself uh, says, I don't know club, and we don't need to feel uh, shamed to, to be part of this, I don't know club. And we don't need to draw conclusions and uh, draw timelines and say, Jesus is going to come so and so here. If we say that we are going to, we can find and predict when Jesus is going to come. And we are saying we are wiser than Jesus. We are, as if Jesus could not predict when he is going to come. He said, I don't know. Only father knows. And we are saying, Jesus, you don't know. It's okay. I know the prophecy well. I can interpret well. Or I can predict when you are going to come. So that would be blasphemous and crazy. So uh, we don't know when is he going to come. So we can be open. Uh, somebody said that uh, uh, you uh, you make your plans and mini as you work ministry work and all as if Jesus is not going to come in the next fifty years, and you work as if Jesus is going to come tonight. So both imminent and delayed. So let us walk as if Jesus is going to come tonight and let us plan as if Jesus is going to come 50 years later or even more. We don't know. So, and the la one more thing is that the political, the nature of uh, his coming, either it is political or spiritual only. This is also not very clear because in Acts chapter 6, one verse 6 and 7, where disciples asked him, uh, you know, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel this time? And uh, Jesus says, sorry, the, let me read the words. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you, uh, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Then he said to them, it is not for you to know the times and seasons which the father has put in his authority. Then he says the word, but you shall receive the power when the Holy Spirit you, uh, comes upon you and you shall be my witness in Jer Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the world. The nature, uh, he, they asked, are you going to uh, restore kingdom to Israel? Like, are you going to rest, restore the uh, political kingdom? And what all we are talking about, look at Jerusalem, what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening in America, what, <laughs> go after them. <laughs> go after what president said and these and that. He's saying it is, it is not for you whether it is physical kingdom or political kingdom, sorry, if it is political kingdom or not, it is not for you. And what, what is there something that, that is important for you? The next words he said, you shall receive the power and you be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, end of the world. Jesus is saying, don't make speculations and don't be concerned about this uh, political aspect of it, but do your duty, that is go and be my witness. So that's what we need to take when it comes to second coming. So our, and our duty is to watch and wait. As Matthew chapter 25 verse 13 says, watch therefore you not know, uh, you know, sorry, for you know neither the day nor the hour when he comes. So we should be watchful and uh, we should be prepared. That's what John says in 1 John chapter 2 verse 28. And now little children abide in him. Uh, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him uh, in shame at his coming. So we should be prepared, abide in him. What is the way we can be prepared? Abiding in him is our preparation. 
it is not like building to hundreds of churches only it is not building big big ministries or something it is abiding in jesus that is our preparation and uh, also he gave the commission we should not forget fulfilling the great commission that we do that and we should be prepared and so that when jesus come as the master in the parable uh, of uh, master and workers comes back and found his serv servants working well done my faithful servant he may come to us and say let us be prepared and start working on his commission so that he may come and find us working and say uh, well done uh, faith my faithful servant uh, and uh, two last point i would like to say and close over emphasizing uh the sorry over emphasizing the when of jesus return can divert our minds from the central focus of the gospel jesus saving work for all and for for all humans accomplished in his life death and resurrection if we focus so much on when and when and when we could know and we don't focus on what jesus has accomplished for us and it is going to divert us the gospel is good news news is the report of past events okay so gospel is about we talk about things that are certain let us not uh, speculate about things we don't know which are not certain yet and uh, <coughs> that's going to divert us <coughs> of course we should be prepared for the second coming and in the last as jesus was uh, saying in revelation chapter 20 verse 20 you know i am coming soon says the lord and as john let us all be ready and prepared wait for him abide in him and say amen come lord jesus come that should be our perspective towards the second coming thank you i know i have taken all the time so that i close my thing so i don't uh, need to uh, take the i mean bring the second coming thing again in case un uh, unless Uh, if you want to deal more with the details of various perspectives but as i said we should be focusing on the nature uh, and the purpose of second coming mostly and the task jesus has left us with thank you let me okay well we have about 4 uh, minutes for questions <laughs> uh, any questions uh... Yes, Surya Murthy, go ahead. Uh, I think you have to unmute Surya Murthy, Praveen. Yes. Is he in position? the last thing i mentioned is the gca position only sorry i did i forgot to quote that uh, the statement uh, i read uh, you know just give me a minute uh, over emphasizing the when of jesus return can divert our minds from the central focus of the gospel jesus saving work for all humanity accomplished and uh, what he accomplished uh, accomplished in his life death resurrection and uh, continuing work as our heavenly high priest and uh, uh, jesa position is jesus is coming back physically for the second time and we don't know when so let us focus more on the the um, uh, you know being a witness that is our position and uh, even pastor dan in, in case if you likes anything to add he can do that. we can take a little extra time in case you have any questions to clarify please feel free to ask yes manasa go ahead see uh, we are we are all we all can't predict we are all not sure whether jesus is going to come or not in the second coming physically so i think we all need to just have hope if we have hope and we we live a good christian life i think that would save us as as we are told that uh, jesus came and he died on the cross and he suffered to take away our sins 
बट ये वी स्टिल डू सिन इट इज ह्यूमन नेचर नो वन कैन लिव एज अ सेंट हाँ पीपल हैव लिव एज सेंट्स बट इट्स डिफिकल्ट सो पीपल आर सिनिंग and it is not that that yes jesus is continuing god is continuing to forgive us our sins but i think the hope that we have i think is going to save us or is um, it is it just that we have to have we have to know him and we have to believe in him or if we can have hope i, I think those who are non believers also have the the hope in them um, that they can be saved on the on the coming of jesus when he comes again uh the thing is uh, who ever put their faith in jesus christ they do have hope and their hope is he is coming back physically and we are going to be with him and we are going to live with him and share life with him that is our hope and we all have hope second coming gives us hope in spite of all the troubles we have jesus is coming and uh, we are going to have a good uh, i mean we are going to experience a life in full its fullness that is the hope we have it is about hope okay so so what about sin then how how can how can, we we have hope all of us have hope that okay we will we will be on the side of jesus so we will be the chosen people but then what about sin sin is yes. still happening we are still sinning so yes. how how are we going to be judged are we going to be judged on our sins or are we going to be judged on the hope that we have uh for the, as far as our sins are concerned we have been already judged as saints that the scripture says that we are justified by faith all our sins are forgiven we are justified and jesus is helping in the uh, through holy spirit in our lives to overcome sin and in the second coming he is going to set us completely free from that he is going to set us completely free from the sin so he is going to help us in that so that can be our hope we are going to live in a sinless world soon yeah i think so because because what i believe in what i believe in is that if if we take ownership of our sins if if okay we are sinning we have committed sins whether it is a petty sin or it is a great sin but i think the day or the time that we take ownership of our sins i think then we are saved Uh, i guess uh, we your uh, this particular thing again we we need, we need to come back per, perhaps we can discuss about the judgment uh, where we can uh, deal this matter also as of now we'll uh, focus more on the second coming that particular event yeah yeah i may just want to mention uh, vanessa that we uh, to complete this particular uh, topic we will also discuss judgment so maybe uh, we can uh, explore that a little bit more when we uh, discuss the subject on judgment is that okay uh, i may just want to mention i think you made some comment about whether he comes or not i mean uh, we have enough reason to believe that he will literally come that's a literal coming uh, as pravin said the physical come uh, so in other words uh, it is not symbolic uh, it is uh, something that will happen literally that is our position any other questions or thoughts yeah may i ask you something yes yeah, shila go ahead uh, what about the thousand year reign that uh, the book of revelation talks about when is that going to be uh, pastor you are you are answering or uh... yeah you go ahead you are the you are the you are the pastor <laughs> man you are putting me on the spot uh, and the first thing is uh, the question when is not a right question for us uh, especially uh, we don't have clarity about all these prophecies number one and uh, regarding the tower millennial kingdom as i said since we don't know this when we we are not able to give you any specifically you know certain answer that it is going to be this time or it is going to be that time but one thing for sure such kind of life is uh is something that jesus is offering and may made available for us in the days to come that only we can tell we cannot tell when but it is available for us does it make any sense uh yeah to some extent yes <laughs> perhaps uh, if i can just add yeah if i can just add um 
you know, Christ is coming, literally. And uh, like was uh, mentioned, he brings the fullness of the kingdom. Now, the question is, is there going to be a thousand year reign when he comes? And then there is going to be some, uh, you know, like we used to believe, a hundred year period where people are again made to or allowed to sin. And then there is going to be a second resurrection or a third resurrection. Uh, these are questions I think we have struggled with uh, in our past, you know, pre-Reformation days. Uh, so, but one thing we know for sure, and that is Christ brings the fullness of the kingdom and he's coming to stay. Uh, and how that thousand year will play out is, like we said, we might not be able to fully, uh, you know, explain it, uh, you know, uh, at this moment. So we will wait and see how that plays out. <laughs> yes, Anil, go ahead. No, but why can't we take as the, the thousand year or the millennial, as the word says, as a literal reign? I mean, the... the the kingdom or will be established after at Jesus' second coming. And the thousand year reign will start after that. And, and the, I think the Bible speaks cl clearly about that. So, yeah. uh, of course, there is a year for a thousand uh, year could, a day could be a thousand years and all that's a different thing. Right. But uh, I, I thought that this thousand year reign was uh, pretty much uh, fixed, <laughs> if I may say so. Right. You want to say something about that, Praveen? Uh, I, I would like to say only one. Yeah, you can take. You can take. You have the freedom to take. Not only you. As I said, uh, God gives us certain freedom, uh, especially uh, in these kind of matters. You know, you can we can have a perspective about it. There is no problem with that. You can have, you can take that and you can have another perspective also because as I said, these are non-essential matters. Yeah, essential is matter is Jesus is coming back physically. That is essential. So we can have little freedom on this, uh, sir, actually. I think uh, if I can just uh, add to what is already said, uh, there is maybe a slight ambiguity uh, because you say Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years. Now, does it mean that he stops reigning after a thousand years? I mean, does it mean that he will now suddenly say, okay, uh, I've had enough now, you know, let me give it to the devil now. <laughs> uh, I think see, that is where some ambiguity comes in. Uh -huh. And the thousand year perhaps uh, has a literality to it, but it might also have a symbolic element to it. And that's why there is a slight, you know, I mean, to say a freedom for us to look at it from you know different perspectives so we cannot dogmatically say thousand years after that what can we say hundred years of no christ christ is not going to reign so these are a little bit you know difficult so may I just add one single comment uh, yeah. that i always feel wonder i always wonder when people talk more about thousand years reign and even greater and better thing is yet to come Thousand years is just a small piece. Throughout eternity, we are going to be with God and he is going to be with us in his light. And I feel that would be much more beautiful and uh, uh, wonderful than uh, these thousand years. <laughs> so let us focus on the best. Yeah. Any thoughts, Anil? Uh, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fine. I mean, uh, like many things, the Bible is not very clear or absolutely clear about certain situations. And yeah. perhaps this is one of them, no question about it. And uh, yeah, I agree that, uh, of course, there's a glorious future that awaits us. And that's what we yeah. call the hope of glory. And that's what we should be focused on. Right, right. And let us not forget that Christ is already reigning. Correct. <laughs> The question is, are we submitting to that reign? We who are believers have submitted to that reign. There are many who have not. And uh, so uh, there is a, you know, uh, an expandable meaning there. <laughs> but one, uh, of course, I don't know if this is uh, outside the topic. That's 
like uh, you know jesus is coming to uh, redeem his people you know those who believe in him and are in christ they are the ones who will meet him and he will be part of his kingdom now what happens to the rest like you know the calvinists believe those who have been predestined they are the ones who would be saved the rest will be you know off with their head kind of thing now uh, I, I don't think the bible is very clear about that but at the same time i would not like to think that those who haven't even heard the name of jesus in uh, you know in the jungles of africa or or the you know tribes of uh, andaman or something that they will not be <clears throat> given a chance at all to know christ and they will be just judged and uh, finished off okay so i don't know whether there is any thought or clarity on that now all i can say there is you know you're you're basically talking about universality of salvation right yeah i think that is a subject which maybe we can take a little bit more or discuss more in the judgment when we we talk about the judgment yeah uh yes vanessa go ahead yeah that that is what it's 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 not exactly about judgment also what i want to know is that the bible stresses most mostly on the jews and jerusalem but are we not we are also not jews we are not from jerusalem okay the jews jews are the ones that denied jesus okay being their king or being the salvation or whatever but then okay if he is coming is he going to come only to the jews and only to jerusalem or we are also going to witness him or he can come maybe to india as the second coming or to some other place or mm-hmm. is there a specific place that is mentioned where jesus is going to appear the second time the second resurrection as as uh, the mount or there can be any other place go ahead pravin most of the story of jesus and whatever happened they happen around uh, in and uh, in jewish culture and jewish land everything that is the reason we have the story of uh, jewish things and all so if G- if that happen in india i guess definitely we would be having our indian story about those but uh, it is written in the scripture that he is going to come on to the mount olives so that's why we said about it but anyway in this modern world wherever he comes it's not a big matter here i'm speaking anil is listening to me from america so uh, i don't think that that would be a great deal as of now no uh, one thing i'd like to i think vanessa asked that is christ coming only for the jews or only for the israelites and for the jerusalemites and so on i mean uh, we need to remember that we are all in christ we are saved by faith we are abraham's children by faith and therefore we are his children and he will come for all of us the gentiles and the jews and so on who have faith in christ we are saved by faith faith in christ and therefore we are his people so it's not every anybody or whoever believes in christ and has faith will he will come for them and they will be saved and, and so it's 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 not just that uh, you know he will only come for the jews or only for those in jerusalem he is for everybody jerusalem. those who believe in him jerusalem. am i right jerusalem. absolutely okay. i think god's redemption and all broke the walls and crossed the borders of uh, jerusalem and in fact he told us to go to, to the other parts of the world to witness him so his redemption is for everyone and it broke the walls and borders and everything and his his redemption and salvation and uh, the comfort he is going to bring in second coming also uh, it is for everyone it is available for all of us right uh, the the apostle paul said uh, there is no more jew or gentile right in other words christ now has transcended those uh those divisions he certainly used the jewish nation or the nation of israel to begin the process of that redemption but now in christ uh the incarnation he now has included all of humanity okay so uh let us not think that uh, you know only the jews have salvation 
it begins with the Jews, but it, you know, extends to all the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, maybe one thought. Uh, yes, Franklin, go ahead. I mean, uh, talking of the purpose of Christ's second coming, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, sir, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, it says, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. And then it goes on to say, to bring unity in all things in heaven and earth under Christ. Uh, so the purpose of Christ coming is to bridge, to bring unity in heaven and earth, the physical and the spiritual. Explain. It has accomplished all. Jesus has accomplished us, uh, accomplished that already in his incarnation. That, that's what my previous message was about. <laughs> Jesus accomplished united heaven and earth and he brought heaven and earth together. And his second coming is going to make us experience it in its fullness. So Jesus, when he said it is accomplished, it was it indeed it, it was accomplished. Okay. I think that's well said. Uh, one, one question, uh, you know, and maybe we'll stop with this. Many Christians believe when they die, they go to heaven. <laughs> so, Praveen, what would you think? Uh, is that the kingdom? Uh, what happens to those who are in heaven? That is not how the Bible speaks about speaks. Uh, Bible does not use the language where we go to heaven. As I said uh, previously also, we have a pattern in the Bible. Always God came down to his people. And Apostle Paul writes a word, there is no one that says not even one. There is no one seek after God. There is no person who wants to go to God. Always God came down to us. So that is the sequence continued. And uh, even book of Revelation doesn't end as we going to heaven. The book of Revelation ends, the new Jerusalem coming down to his people, yeah. to the earth, new earth. And uh, in fact, uh, we read a verse in Revelation chapter 21, where it says, God tabernacled himself amongst his people. It is not he has taken up his people to be with him. No, he came down to his people and he lived with his living with them. So Christian hope is God coming down to us and living. And at the same time, we don't need to misunderstand. We don't have any part in heaven thing and all. Because Jesus is in incarnation. Uh, he, he has brought heaven and earth together. So uh, we will be opened to new dimensions where probably we, may need, we can step into these and that walls also. Just as Jesus did. He walked through the walls. Sometimes he disappeared. Sometimes he appeared. So, so we, we are going, it, it is going to be something amazing. We cannot describe it yet. But uh, just <coughs> believing that we are going to leave this world and escape it, escape it and go to heaven, that is not the Christian faith. Anil, you had a thought? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I mean, extending from there, in First Thessalonians, that same thing that you quoted, Praveen, uh, where Jesus comes down, he doesn't come to earth, but his saints rise up and meet him and they go up. What does that mean? Is, are they going to heaven or they are just suspended in midair or what is that all about? A uh, premillennial view says that they are going to be in the midair where uh, seven years of uh, lamb of the wedding is going to take place. And at the end of the seven years, after having very good wedding meal, they are going to come back onto the earth. Yeah, so that has to happen in heaven, no? Nah. It can't be happening in. They the say heaven. God can do anything. God can do anything, but these these people say it is going to be in the mid air. People are God is going to meet them in the mid air, and yeah. they, where there is going to be a bima throne judgment, all those things are there. Uh, so nothing is impossible for God. Who could make uh, Peter to walk on the water? Could definitely arrange a wedding in the air. So, no, 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 that's not the point. The point was whether, you know, the saints are going to be in heaven even for a while or whatever. We, 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 the, uh, the, the, what the Thessalonians is talking about is that those saints will meet Jesus in the sky and will be in heaven and then they will come down with him later. Uh, uh, <clears throat> 
that, that it says so somewhere, but I, I don't know what the interpretation of thinking there is. Right. So we don't have all the details. So perhaps uh, we can leave it to God's uh, transcendence and yeah. sovereignty. I, I can, I can, I, if I can just offer something there, maybe it is symbolic of the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. The coming into the air is perhaps a fact that every, you know, everybody will be resurrected. So, and then it is very clearly, like you said, Daniel, uh, they are coming back to the earth. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the new heavens and the new earth are finally our destination. You know? Of course, with God. <laughs> and God himself is that. <clears throat> On earth. Yeah. Well, <laughs> A new dimension. I don't think you know we will experience Earth just as we have a physical body now, but we'll have glorified bodies. It's a new dimension. Okay. I mean, uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, done quite well. Uh, we have taken a little extra time. I hope we didn't make you miss anything. But let's close to for to, today's study. Vincent, can I request you to please uh, close our session with prayer, Vincent Chan? If you're with us. I'm not sure. Uh, Vincent, can you still hear us? He has to unmute. Okay. Uh, Praveen, can you unmute him? No, uh, no he's not available, it seems. Probably. Uh, I don't know if there is a network problem. Uh, then maybe Sheila, are you still with us? Uh, yes, I'm. Um, Can yeah. you, yeah. you know, close the session with prayer? Thank you. Okay. Almighty God, our loving Father in heaven, we come before you, Father, with much love and gratitude. We thank you, Father, for opening our hearts and minds to understand many things that you taught us through your servant. There are, we are still very not clear about some of the things that you have written in your word, Father. We want to understand things more clearly as we go ahead learning more and more about you and your word and your life. So we thank you very much, Father, for all your blessings once again. We ask you to protect us and thank you for protecting us all these years, especially during this past two years. Continue to protect us, Father, as many of us struggle to take care of ourselves and our loved ones. We ask you to be with us in everything we do and help us to bring honor and glory to your name, Father, through everything that we do. We pray and ask you all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you all. Bye-bye.